So your father restored this bass for Scott. Scott, the, Scott originally got the bass from Red Mitchell, right? Red yes, he did. Red actually went out. Scotty either had uh, had his bass stolen or it was destroyed beyond repair. It was stolen. He was using that. Yeah. I believe it was stolen, but it was uh, a German bass, kind of a generic German bass. And, my, and Red Mitchell had gone out to the West Coast, and he actually located, I believe, his bass, the Lowendale, with that cutaway. And this bass was also at Stein on the Vine Music in Hollywood, California, which still exists. I mean, at that time, back in the 50s, it was considered one of the leading bass shops on the West Coast. Yeah. And Red called Scotty. Scotty flew out to the West Coast because he was looking for a smaller dimensioned instrument of this nature. Yeah. And brought the bass back, purchased it, brought it back to New York, but wasn't totally satisfied with the sound of it at that time. Yeah. And he basically was, uh, how my dad got to meet Scotty was the fact that he was doing a Gunther Schuller project that George de Vivier was involved with, a whole bunch of bass players. And at that point, uh, George said, uh, Scotty had shown him the bass, and George said, you know, this could use some help. And uh, brought him out to meet my dad, and my dad fell in love with Scotty. I mean, you know, I, would, I often say that, you know, my dad had told me, because I was pretty young at that time. Yeah. And, uh, Basically, Scotty came and George brought him down at his basement of his home at that time. And uh, George came in and he says, I want you to meet someone, Sam. And my, my father heard this, Scotty playing in the other room, had no idea who he was. And he said, who is that and what is that? He had never heard <laughs> playing like that before. Fell in love with Scotty. So Scotty kind of became an institution at our house because Gloria, his girlfriend, yeah. lived out in Seaford, New York. Our, our shop at that time and my dad's home was in Merrick which is like two towns away from Seaford. So yeah. Scotty would come out to visit Gloria, then on his way back or way out, he would visit my dad. So I remember Scotty coming to the house all the time. Wow. It's just, unfortunately, I was too young to really appreciate the opportunity that I was given to, you know, get to know him. Yeah, yeah. But it was, uh, that's how we met him. And, you know, my dad did the restoration. It went over a period of time. Scotty got the bass back, and it was very similar to the way it was. In fact, to the point when the bass was damaged in a car accident that Scotty unfortunately died in. Yeah. When I eventually restored this base, which was in 19, it spanned from 1986 to 1988, uh, it, it basically, I looked at this as I try to keep as much of the original restoration of my dad, what my dad did. So the crossbars, although they were, had been uh, loosened from the back, we kept those crossbars. I mean, there was obviously not only uh, fire damage or impact damage to the instrument, but there was fire damage yeah. to the instrument also. This rib on this side had been burnt through. I get a uh, shot of that. The area of this top had been also burnt through, and the neck and scroll had been, you know, destroyed yeah. beyond repair. So we made a new neck, new scroll for it in the Prescott Manor. I uh, replaced the rib on this side and then grafted back the wood in here. So it was. Very intensive restoration, it was something that spanned really almost a year and a half, a year and three quarters. But the ideal, our goal was was to have this base done in time to bring it out to California for the ISB convention. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, got to do business. <laughs> That's all right. We can pause it. Yeah, just just pause it for one second. We're rolling. Okay. Okay. So we last left off. Um, you, had, you had restored the base. That's where we left it off. That's there. correct, yeah. The, the restoration spanned the period from about 1986 to 1988 in time for the ISB convention that was uh -huh. held out in Berkeley University of, Ber uh, USC, oh, was it? University of Berkeley in California. They had the ISB convention that was dedicated to Scott LaFaro and, and Fred Zimmerman. Uh -huh. And we brought the base out there, and Red got a chance to see the base. Red was alive at the time, and yeah. he was really taken back by it. And you know there was uh, it was it was an interesting time for myself and my father because you know yeah. we didn't know wh what direction we were going to go with the bass, but that convention really uh, put in our minds it was an instrument that was going to stay with us, be a personal part of our you know collection here, and yeah. uh, and we've tried to do a lot of good as I mentioned to you. You know the instrument was used by Mill Tinton who was in the, yeah. that famous photography session that was held in Manhattan Center. Mark Johnson recently used it, and now I'm privileged to say <laughs> they used it for an entire album, which is the first album that wow. was utilized since the Vanguard album. Wow. It was, a, it was a truly amazing experience. Well, I feel honored that you used the bass. I truly do. And I can really see how, I mean, I, I wonder how much the bass inspired Scott, because it really, you really can't play anything on the instrument. It plays so easily, and I think that's a credit to your setup, not to the instrument in particular, you know, I you and your dad's that. setup. 
my dad did amazing things with this instrument. I mean, considering at the time, Scotty played with a very low action. He was playing gut strings. Yeah. Steel strings hadn't really come into the scene. Yeah. It's hard to say where Scotty would have been today. You know, I probably would have made the transition over from uh, gut to steel or some purlon or some other yeah. transitional string over a gut. But, uh, yeah. but at that time, he set this bass up with a very low action. I mean, people... When you hear the recordings, you can hear a lot of finger noise, a lot of fingerboard noise, because the strings were set up almost on a steel string basis with that low height, wow. but the fingerboard had to be regulated so right and so accurately to allow for that. Yeah. So there. You, so okay. So I have to re. I have to make a note when I do the second publishing of my transcription book. I have to make a note about that because I kind of, after transcribing everything and playing them, I was able to play all the solos, and and still get that sound of finger noise I was getting from playing a you know more of like a not wouldn't say high action but certainly a solid medium, medium action, action yeah. and I, I was just thinking that okay so gut strings are spongier so like some people said he had to have low strings because that's the only way you could play that fast and so i kind of got hung up on that I'm like well no i could play all i could play that fast with a with a medium action and still digging and he's getting such a big sound yeah. that i couldn't imagine that springy gut strings on a with low action would actually produce that much sound out of a bass but now that i've actually played the bass I could completely see how you could have low gut strings on this bass and it would still sound as big as it did. Well, this bass, I, I, man, look at <laughs> Scotty's relationship with this bass is very symbiotic because yeah. this bass, you know, it, it's a great instrument and yeah. any good player is going to sound good on this bass. But Scott brought something special out of this instrument. Oh, Obviously, yeah. it, it's historic, I mean, what he brought out of this yeah. instrument. And, but, and I could see, I mean, like I said, it was perfect because then some of it is just having, being able to have a low action. To, to try to explore what you're hearing in your head. I mean, you could hear how he had all these, like we talked about in 1960, you could hear him busting through the eggshell, you know, oh, yeah. and, and then in you know, 61 it just happened. And So I could see how having a low action would actually, you know, you don't have to worry about the facility of, you know, negotiating the instrument on top of trying to get out what you're hearing in your head. And so having a bass that speaks this well, you know, I think that was, yeah, symbiotic. I mean, well, it was. I mean, really? and what made it, it was very unusual setup because in those days, you know, you're playing gut, gut strings, a G string would be, you know, a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch off of the fingerboard yeah. for pulling purposes. You know, yeah, that's kind of right. Scott changed the whole rule. I mean, he had my father discuss it with my father, and my father agreed with him. I mean, Scott, you know, I mean, he was the yeah. great, a great bass player, but he really wasn't a bass player. I mean, he brought the bass. Yeah. A whole different uh, venue of, uh, of thoughts and, and philosophies, you know, from yeah. the sax playing, clarinet playing, and everything yeah. of that nature. So, I mean, he needed this to be a comfortable setup, and that's what was done. You know? So, it, it was an interesting situation. A lot of people said, oh, anybody can play like that. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, you know, no, you need it. It's, it's more than just being, able, I mean, I could play a million notes on a bass. You know, playing notes is not making music, you know. It's what he was doing, the way he was approaching the, the piano trio and in the way he was soloing his, I mean, yeah, it had nothing to do with, you know, him being able to play a lot of notes. <laughs> no, I mean, it was the musicality of it. Yeah. Also. I mean, it was the physicality of it, but it was also the musicality of it. You know, the philosophy is his musical philosophy that he brought over to the instrument. Yeah. And yeah. It was very unusual. And, you know, it, I mean, it set the standards for everybody. Yeah. You, me, everyone. Yeah. You know, and I don't think there's a lot of people that have ever come to that level. I don't really know if they ever will. I, I mean, yeah, because then almost like, yeah, how do you innovate like he innovated? What, what's, what, what is there left? And it's always kind of hard to imagine because you can't imagine what there is until somebody actually does it, I guess. But well, that's what I just said to you before. Yeah. Where would Scotty have been today? Yeah. I think he'd probably be into a you know, electric bass. I think he'd have probably, you know. Yes. My bass teacher used to tell me that, you know, my bass teacher, Tony, was uh, from upstate New York, and he said that they used to go hang out at this club, and it was a blues band playing, and, you know, this guy had a Fender, like early Fender, mm -hmm. you know, telly bass. Um, and, uh, and Scott, you know, he used to, you know, Tony used to sit in, Scott used to pop in and sit in also, you know, and play on the electric bass. You know, well, you know what? Uh, so he had his hands on one at yeah, least once sure. or twice. <laughs> Uh, it just would have been very interesting to see where we would have taken this instrument at the levels. I mean, oh. You know, he was uh, not that he was in the beginning stages by any means. Yeah. The evolution of his playing was well developed. I mean, it really, you know, was at a very high level. But I think he was not at his full growth capacity oh. by any means. And then I, I, I read in a book that Miles Davis was talking to them about doing a record with the Bill Evans trio, Miles with Bill Evans. Really? Yeah, I think that's in Helene's book. Uh, and, I mean, well, that's right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. You know, could you imagine that? Like the, you know, amazing. That amazing. trio with Miles. What, what, uh, uh, well, 
he's Tragic. a most influential player. Yeah. He left his mark, a historic mark, no question about it. Yeah. Man, well, thank you so much for your time and, and for allowing me to take this, you know, treasure out of the shop for a week. Well, it's my <laughs> pleasure, Phil. I, I really feel honored. I can't wait to hear it. It's going to oh. be a great, amazing, uh, you know, musical work. I hope so. It's, um, yeah, I guess, you know, I don't know. I just, I, whatever happens is, I've played this bass for a week. If nothing else happens in my life, just that experience of having, you know, this under my fingers and playing it as much as I did for a week was amazing. I felt very good about it. I hope people like the record. I hope you like the record. <laughs> I'm sure.